Hello everyone and welcome to PC Retro Tech. In this week's video I've got a story for you and it's a story of a monitor like this IBM 5153 here. Uh, in 1981 when IBM bought out their original IBM PC one of the options for it was a color graphics adapter, a CGA card. And uh, they didn't actually have a monitor for this at the time. Uh, there were other monitors available, although some of them only displayed eight colors or displayed brown as a dark yellow, for example. Uh, but two years later, IBM brought out the 5153, which was their CGA monitor. And so this is a story of an IBM 5153, just like this one, and also a story of a pixel artist. The pixel artist I'm talking about is the one that's responsible for the 2D graphics in this demo, which probably needs no introduction to many of the viewers of this channel. It's the by now very famous 8088 MPH demo, which won the old school demo competition at Revision 2015. And it's running here on my IBM PC 5150 with CGA graphics. Of course, it's using the CGA composite output, and I apologize if it doesn't look or sound quite right here. The PC speaker doesn't work in my machine, and uh, I'm actually running the graphics output through an NTSC to power converter into a Commodore 1084S monitor. I'm not showing you the whole demo here, but just the pixel art. And of course this demo was famous because they used NTSC artifacting to get way more colors than you would otherwise be entitled to. A thousand colors on a 1981 IBM CGA uh, computer. This is the most iconic scene in the demo. It's the DeLorean from Back to the Future, which is actually the theme of the demo. And it's running over a scrolling background, all real time of course, with an 8088 CPU running at 4.77 megahertz. As you can see, there's some really outstanding and groundbreaking pixel art in this demo. Our artist is one of these six, and if you know a couple of the others, you can narrow it even further. Now according to the credits here, there are just two people that are responsible for the different kinds of graphics. We're not talking about the polygons, the 3D vector graphics done by Scarly. We're talking about the 2D pixel art that I've been showing you, and according to the, uh, the credits here, that was done by Vialr. I won't say much about Vile R the person because he's actually remained an anonymous individual and you can see that from the demo zoo where his real name is still listed as Vile Rancor and that is actually just an old demo scene moniker that he used some years back. Uh, some demo sceners have long since made their identities public and some are even quite well known in the retro community. That would certainly be the case for a couple of people from the 8088 MPH crew for example. Uh, but others have remained anonymous and we'll certainly respect that. Uh, what I will do though is I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that he's done and made public because I think there's potentially some stuff of real genuine interest for people watching this channel. In particular, I'm going to talk a little bit about his blog, and later on in the video, uh, I'll mention his YouTube channel. If you look through the productions that are actually listed for Vilar on the Demo Zoo, uh, you'll see that they're all graphical in nature. Uh, the most recent is ANSI Art, and uh, there are quite a number of art packs. There's an art disc, and uh, there's also a music disc that he did the graphics for. And if you scroll to the end here, uh, where this list starts, you'll see the 8088 MPH demo that we're all familiar with. I think there's some other stuff of interest on his blog and YouTube channel, and I'll put a link uh, in the description to those below. Uh, by the way, some of these are actually videos that you can watch uh, to see the artwork. And uh, Vialar is actually active on YouTube. Uh, he, in fact, he's actually, uh, by all reports, seen a few of the videos on this channel and even commented on one or two of them. I said that I wanted to talk about Vialar's blog, and that's actually found on his website, uh, int10h.org, uh, which is named after the famous graphics mode, of course. Uh, before I get to the blog, I'll just point out there's a link here to a big fonts pack uh, which has a whole load of different PC and compatible fonts uh, from way back, uh, which has done the rounds on various tech websites uh, recently. Uh, the other thing that's here that's useful is a link to his YouTube account, of course, if you want to check that out. Uh, this is his blog, and there's a particular story on here that I want to start with today, and that's where our story begins. The story I want to look at is called Steel Survivor, an IBM XT Tale. 
It's from 2018 and it's actually the story of how Vile R got his IBM 5160 machine. Uh, it seems to have been sent to him by Trickster, who's one of the other members of the 8088 MPH crew. And uh, it's a beautiful machine, as you can see. Uh, but this story goes into details about how it was very badly damaged in shipping on the way to him. Now, this is not normal shipping damage at all. Uh, you can see that the very thick steel plate on this machine is completely bent out of shape. Uh, and this uh, machine really received extraordinarily rough uh, treatment in the shipping uh, to him. Uh, it's, of course, it was packed very, very well, but uh, you can't help it when uh, it's almost destroyed on the way there. Now, fortunately, the machine works, but at the very bottom of his blog, uh, there was something that caught my eye. And uh, this is what the story is about today. So you can see here, he gives a list of things in 2018 that he still wants. And one of them is an IBM 5153 monitor. Now you would have imagined that someone who had been on the 8088 MPH crew would have original hardware. And indeed, uh, a number of attempts had been made to get uh, original hardware to Vile R. So it turns out, uh, I was able to contact Vilar and ask him about this, and he told a very interesting story, which is the one that I'm going to be relating today, uh, and I have permission to tell this story on uh, this channel. Uh, he'll also probably do a blog about it at some point. And uh, the crux of the thing is that he actually had uh, no less than three attempts to get an IBM 5153 monitor to him. Uh, the first, uh, from the description that he gave, was an eBay seller, and uh, this turned up in many pieces. Uh, the second one was from uh, a donor who uh, had wrapped it very well, uh, knowing what had happened with the previous one, and did everything to get it there safely, but it also arrived uh, completely destroyed. Uh, so most of the uh, discussion today is going to be about uh, the third monitor, which was documented very, very carefully uh, because of the previous uh, incidents with the earlier two monitors. And so we actually have photographs. Uh, thanks very much to Vile R for providing photographs uh, and uh, also details about uh, this story. Now, before sending any rare and expensive retro PC items through the mail, uh, the first thing that you have to do, of course, is go on a forum like vcfed.org or Vogons and ask the experts who've done this before uh, what they recommend. And that's exactly what happened uh, for this third monitor. And in fact, uh, a lot of people on VCFED gave uh, really excellent suggestions. Uh, and these range from shipping the monitor with the glass down uh, to to double boxing and all sorts of other information about shipping services and uh, packing. I've had a variety of experiences with monitors being sent to me and so far there's only one constant. Uh, all of the people who sent them to me have been absolutely insistent that they know exactly what they're doing and that the monitor will arrive in one piece. Uh, the reality is a little bit different. Uh, I've had everything from monitors turning up in soggy wet boxes to bits of cardboard taped together instead of a box uh, to popped uh, air pockets uh, all the way through to scratched monitors, cracked plastic, uh, you name it, it's happened. Uh, the only case that I've been really satisfied with so far was a Romanian guy who sent me this beautiful NEC Multisync V721. Uh, it's a huge 17-inch monitor, and of course, on account of its rarity, I begged him to pack it really well. And he said, don't worry, I'll pack it to NASA standards, it will absolutely arrive in one piece. Now, I'm skeptical about the NASA standard, uh, but he certainly knew what he was doing when he was packing it. Uh, so he put it inside an inner box uh, with a lot of packing to make sure it was secure, bubble wrap and so on, and uh, some compressible material. Uh, the inner box was very sturdy, and outside that he had very thick slabs of polystyrene foam, and finally uh, a, a very sturdy outer box, which was taped up extremely well. Uh, that actually all arrived in one piece without a scratch on it, and as you can see, uh, this beautiful piece of history uh, has survived. Uh, but let's get back to our story and see how it lines up with uh, that particular method. 
Now this is the inside of the 5153 in question and the person who's sending this has it open uh, in order to check for any large objects that might be floating about that could cause damage. Uh, now you have to be very careful opening these things, they can retain a very high charge which can be dangerous, uh, but these 5153s in particular have uh, some very uh, fragile plastic caps that go over the screw holes and I've actually managed to snap mine uh, just opening the monitor to have a sticky beak inside. Uh, the most sensitive part of these is certainly the glass tube at the back here, the so-called neck of the tube. And uh, if this snaps, uh, the entire tube will implode, and this can be dangerous for whoever's shipping it. Uh, and it, some companies will actually not ship CRTs uh, for that reason. So it's certainly something that has to be checked. Now, in order to minimize uh, torque on this tube, uh, this is a fairly hefty PCB that can move uh, side to side here. Uh, some people pack things in here, but you have to consider that anything you pack in here may actually just increase the amount of force that can be transmitted from the outside of the box uh, to the PCB and then to the neck. Uh, so another favoured way of minimising this problem is to pack the monitor with the glass uh, front facing down, uh, with the cover on of course. And the theory here is that most of the movement is going to be in the up or down direction, especially if the box is dropped. And uh, this will minimise the side to side torque on this thing and uh, minimise the chance that the thing is snapped. Well here the monitor is apparently working before it was sent and I guess you want to have one last hurrah before sending a valuable piece like this off into an uncertain future. Uh, but more seriously, uh, it does make sense to characterise any problems that a monitor has before sending it. Uh, if it has to be repaired for any reason at the other end, it's nice to know which faults could have resulted from some kind of pre-existing electronic issue and which faults are more likely to be a result of being dropped out of the uh, you know, luggage hold of an aircraft, for example. A lot of people don't realise just how many stops these things make along the way. Uh, I've had monitors sent to me from the US where they've had five or eight stops before they even get to the port where they exit the US. And there are of course multiple stops uh, from there. And these things are handled in a very rough manner. Uh, these companies are typically dealing with hundreds of millions of packages a year and uh, so each one doesn't get the care and attention uh, that we'd really like them to get. Well this is the box that was used in this case and uh, if that doesn't look square to you, uh, it doesn't look square to me either. And I had to look for a while but there's actually a fold in the side of the box here and uh, this is where the corner of the box should be. And the reason this has happened is that the whole box has been folded uh, to ship the box itself. Uh, now the one thing I do like here is that there's a double corrugated cardboard which is very thick and rigid and should protect from external intrusion uh, quite well, which is certainly what we want. Well this is where things start to get interesting. Uh, the first step seems to have been to wrap the monitor very tightly in a plastic bag, presumably watertight, uh, to prevent water damage. And this is a very real risk if the monitor is left out for any length of time in the rain or snow, as can sometimes happen, uh, you know, even just when loading and unloading an aircraft. This is the inside of the inner box, uh, which is also a very sturdy cardboard, as we'll see a little bit later on. And you can see there's these polystyrene mounts around the corners there. Uh, this is obviously to hold the monitor up. It's going to be face down with the glass at the bottom here. And there's also some kind of sheet or towel or something like that in the bottom to prevent uh, damage to that glass. Now you don't want anything that will transfer force through to the glass, so propping the monitor up like this uh, really helps and uh, obviously all of that compressible material, uh, if there's any sudden downward force, uh, it's going to slow everything down before it hits the bottom of the box and whatever's underneath it. Well it looks like the monitor's in the box now, I'm not sure what the orientation is, uh, to me it looks like the glass is actually at the top in this particular shot. Uh, and I'm not sure what uh, the theory of all the different packing materials is, but I imagine it's probably just whatever was available on hand. Uh, but I can say that when I've had monitors sent to me from overseas, sometimes people use material that is just too compressible uh, or which pops in transit. And that leaves big gaps and the monitor just bounces around inside the box, uh, especially when it's thrown down the runway. 
This is the inner box all taped up and uh, this is a very good idea. These uh, printer boxes are usually very durable. Uh, they seem to not deform very much and uh, you know they seem to be thicker than the average cardboard. This is the inside box packed into that big outside box that we saw earlier and it looks like there's some big old slabs of uh, polystyrene in there which are good because they sort of fill up the voids and uh, they don't move about very much uh, but there, it looks like there's also some shock absorbing material in there as well uh, just to uh, give it some extra protection looks like there's a whole load of that packing peanut stuff thrown in on top and uh, this should fill up any gaps and stop things from uh, moving about too much inside the box and now you can see that the outer box is all taped up and it's been carefully labelled at the top uh, and signs on the side to say what, which direction is up uh, in the hope that the people who transport this thing uh, pay any attention to it at all. Uh, then the glass will be facing down the entire trip. Now I'm sure that a lot of people uh, taking a look at this are going to say, well this is really all overboard. I've sent monitors before and didn't go to any of this trouble. Uh, so let's actually have a look and see whether this was sufficient and whether anything could have been improved. Well this is what the box looked like when Viola R picked it up, uh, other than the fact that I've blacked out some addresses here. And you can see that uh, it's had a hard life. If you look at the bottom you can see uh, the compression that it's had and so on. It does look like it's in one piece, uh, but appearances can be deceiving. This is the side of the box and apart from the fact that you can see it's split open at the bottom here, uh, there's a hole in the side. And this has happened because somebody has stuck a forklift tine through the side of the box. And yes, that forklift tine made it all the way through the outer box, through the packing material and into the side of the inner box. So I guess the question is, uh, did this monitor survive? And the answer is, yes it did. Uh, here it is sitting on Violar's XT at the other end in working condition. Uh, now, reflecting on this story, uh, this could have gone either way. Uh, if that forklift tine had gone even an inch further, it would have gone through the side of this monitor and possibly destroyed the entire thing. And given that this is actually the third monitor that could have been completely destroyed, uh, it really does show that uh, extreme care needs to be taken when shipping these things. Uh, it may be the case that some people have had luck, really, uh, with a lot less padding and packing. But uh, if you really want to make sure that these things survive, uh, you have to go to some really extreme measures. And I'm glad that this entire story has been documented for the retro community. I believe that uh, Violar is also planning at some point a blog article uh, which might give his perspective on this whole thing. And here's the hero shot showing the monitor displaying all the correct colours after its long and arduous journey. Uh, but there's one more twist to this story which I want to finish out this video with today. Now you may wonder what Vial R did uh, to see his graphical creations if he didn't have original hardware. And the answer, at least in part, is that he got frustrated enough to write some scripts uh, using FFmpeg, which are actually on his GitHub repository, uh, for simulating a CRT. And the results, I think, look just stunning. Uh, so this is a portion of his video, which I'm showing here at quarter speed and uh, without the pumping soundtrack that he has, uh, to encourage you to go and view it uh, on his channel. Say hi from PC Retro Tech and check out his work. Uh, it's really fantastic. Now he did say that you can do this a lot faster, even using GPUs uh, in real time, uh, but I still think that the results here just look so great uh, that it was definitely worth doing. Uh, anyway, that brings us to the end of our story of getting uh, a 5153 monitor into the hands of a pixel artist. Uh, if you enjoyed this, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe the video, and uh, we'll see you in a later video. Bye!